Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 6 of his Lives of the Philosophers, Diogenes Laertes tells us about the Cynics and among them Diogenes, who's probably in ancient times and in our own times, the most famous of the school of the Cynics. Some people think he might have been the first. Others, including Diogenes Laertes, say that he was a student of Socrates' student Antisthenes, who was the first of the Cynic school. It doesn't really matter that much when we think about the way of life that Diogenes was living because he provides a kind of model and, uh, you know, sort of a, a character that stands in for cynicism throughout the ages. Um, by all reports, he had a number of students, including the very famous Crates, who would become the teacher of Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, uh, as well as um, a number of other students, including Hipparchia, who marries Crates. Um, and one of the things that the cynics were really known for is stressing the simplicity of life, having uh, a way of living that one wouldn't starve and one, you know, wouldn't lose fingers or toes to frostbite or things like that. You could live a decent life, but one that was not, um, you could say, dependent upon all of the needs and desires that the ordinary person has, a life in which one's wants could be satisfied fairly easily. And there's some stories told about how Diogenes himself learns from children, the example of children. He says, one day observing a child drinking out of his hands, he, cu he cast away the cup from his wallet with the words, a child has beaten me in plainness or simplicity of living, uteleia. Um, he also threw away his bowl when in like manner he saw a child who had broken his plate, taking up his lentils with the hollow part of a morsel of bread. So he sees these examples of, of people, and you might even say animals, being able to live a life where whatever they have is going to be satisfactory. Whatever they have is going to suffice. And he, you know, breaks things down to a very simple kit. He has a cloak and the cynics were known for this, for doubling up their cloak or sleeping in their cloak, a wallet, or, you know, we don't think of like a little tiny wallet. Think of like a container that you carry by your side. Uh, a staff later on in life when he needs it. He also uses it for uh, things, you know. And then uh, he's quite famous for having had a tub. Now, he actually did apply to somebody to buy him a small house, but the person was delaying. And so instead of wait around for him, he found essentially a barrel. And you can see that in the famous paintings of Diogenes. And he used that as his, as we call them nowadays, tiny house. And so that was sufficient for him. When uh, one of the boys in Athens actually broke his barrel, they punished him and they gave him another barrel <laughs> to, to live in as well. And he's got this great phrase that sort of describes the way of life that he's living, both in terms of its simplicity and in terms of the other features of it. He says, this is Diogenes Laertes on Diogenes the Cynic. He claimed that to fortune, tuche, luck, chance, he could oppose, here it has courage, but a better translation is confidence, tharos, 
the feeling that one can get by no matter what, no matter what the luck or fate or fortune is going to throw in one's lap, you have the resources to deal with that. To convention, um, nomo, uh, in this case, uh, he opposes nature, fusin. And we'll come back to that in just a, a moment. To passion, uh, pathe, logo, uh, reason. So this is actually worth dwelling on quite a bit. Convention, uh, it can also be translated as custom or law. These are the ways of living and the prescribed social duties and expectations that go with any community that you belong to. And th this is a, a constant uh, concern in Greek philosophy, how much of life should be uh, nomos or convention, how much of it should be phusis or nature. When he says nature, he doesn't mean, as we often say, oh, well, that's human nature to excuse people's bad behavior, although Diogenes does behave in some ways that some of us might consider bad. It means the developed nature of a, a human being, the, the nature that we ought to have. Same thing with passion, right? This is covering more than just when like we say, oh, somebody's passionate about something. This covers the emotions. This covers the desires and aversions. This covers all of these sorts of things that move us, that make us their prey, that drive us into things like eros, you know, erotic desire for one thing. We can oppose to that logos, which means reason, but also speech. We can reason with ourselves and say, no, 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 let's not go along with this. And that's going to be discussed a little bit later in terms of pleasure. For the most part, he ate, you know, fairly simple fare when it came to food. He even tried to eat raw meat, but he found that he couldn't uh, simplify things quite so far. That doesn't mean that he wouldn't eat or drink good stuff when he could get it. He was asked at one point what the best kind of wine is, and he said, that which you can get for free, what people are going to give to you, right? And he's, he's also asked at another point, will the wise, meaning you, eat honey cakes? And he says... Why wouldn't they? But they're not going to go looking for that. If somebody happens to give it to them, great. If, if nobody happens to give it to them, also great. So he's not going to be like many people, you know, a gourmand pursuing that. There's a long discussion, at least long for Diogenes Laertes, about training or ascasis, which is well worth looking at. He tells us that um, both mental or, or psychical, you could say, uh, it's a psychikane, or and, and bodily, somatikane, training are necessary. So mental training allows us with constant exercise to form perceptions, fantasiae, things that we, we imagine or we perceive, that secure freedom of movement for virtuous deeds that allow us to be our better selves, you could say. So having the right frame of mind, practicing with the right ideas so that we can, in fact, free ourselves up for doing the good things, doing the right things. That's an important part of training. He also says that... Um, you also need bodily training. Without it, good health and strength being just as much included among the essential things, whether for body or soul. And he says uh, he would adduce indisputable evidence to show how easily from gymnastic training we arrive at virtue. And here's, here's his argument. In the manual crafts and the other arts, the techne, um, it can be seen that the craftspeople develop extraordinary manual skill through practice. Same thing with flute players, same thing with athletes. By working and working and working at it, they change their habits, they change their mind, they change their body. And so he says, if they transferred their efforts to the training of the mind, how certainly their labors would not have been unprofitable or ineffective. So we can determine whether we're going to be happy in life or not by the kind of training that we do.
He also says that um, nothing can, can succeed without strenuous practice. This is capable of overcoming anything. So we need to be careful about what it is that we're setting our hands to. Are we going to focus on learning skills that aren't really profitable to us? Are we going to develop habits that are not going to lead us in any helpful direction? Or are we going to pick other things? So he talks about useless toils, uh, you know, things that we do that are, that are difficult, or you know, ponon in, in Greek. Um, he says we should choose those that are natural, katafusin in Greek, in accordance with nature, in accordance with our nature. And why should we choose them? In order ultimately to be happy, right? In order to enjoy, as he's got it here, eudaimonia, um, a good state of mind for our lives. And there's a really interesting but short discussion there about changing our habits so that we can despise pleasure. He says that... Uh, even despising pleasure is itself most pleasurable when we're habituated to it, just as those accustomed to a life of pleasure feel disgust when they pass over to the opposite experience. Those whose training has been of the opposite kind derive more pleasure from deriving pleasure than from the pleasures themselves. So if you want to have a really pleasant life, self-control despising, meaning looking down upon. It, it's not being a prude or anything like that, but the, the word is kataphronein, which is to look down at as if you're above it. Despising the kinds of pleasures that other people are motivated by. There's also discussions about him using statues in two important ways. One has to do with a kind of um, accustoming himself to difficulties. So hugging statues in the winter the statues are cold and hard, and so you harden up your body by doing that. He also would like lay out in the sun in the hot, you know, the hot summer and do other stuff like walk barefoot on, on you know, hot areas. All of that was to toughen the body. But there's a very interesting practice that he also had with statues. He would beg alms from them. Now you say, well, what's that about? Is he just being kind of a silly drama queen? No, he would beg alms from them and say, this is so that when I ask real people, I'm not going to be so upset when they say no to me. I'll get used to people acting like statues as people do this day when, you know, they walk past a homeless person and they just ignore them, right? The homeless person is asking them for something. So using the statues in two different ways is kind of interesting. Diogenes also set convention aside quite a bit. This is another word for this that Diogenes Laertes talks about is debasing or defacing the currency, which is what either Diogenes himself or his dad got in trouble for in Sinope. He's defacing it in a different way, taking the customary things that people do and violating those social customs. The, probably one of the most egregious examples that's recorded in Diogenes Laertes is masturbating in the marketplace. And then when he gets called on it saying, if only hunger was so easy to satisfy, I would just rub my belly instead. Um, but he also eats in the marketplace, which was apparently kind of a no-no at the time uh, in the Agora, right? The place where everybody would, would gather together. There's also some interesting stories about carrying food. So there's a story about somebody dropping a loaf of bread and being ashamed or embarrassed to pick it up. And Diogenes, in order to like, you know, make a, a point about this, he ties a, a wine jar to a, a bit of rope and drags it behind himself, calling attention to what he's doing, this ridiculous action. He also, at one point, and this is, there's a couple stories about this told about cynics, he gives um, somebody a, a fish, a big old fish, and has him carry it across the marketplace. The guy won't do it. And he says, well, you, you threw our friendship away because you're too ashamed to carry a fish. I guess you don't value it that much. So these are you know, kind of interesting actions that we can talk about. And we can close on 
you know, another thing that he says that I think is really quite good that um, sums up the, the cynic attitude has to do with the kind of life that we, we live, right? When someone declared that life is an evil, that life is bad, he corrected him. He said, it's not life itself that's bad. It's living poorly or living ill, living badly. Um, kakos in this as an adjective in the Greek. And so, you know, that's a really great way to think about it. It's, life is what we make of it. The cynics decide that they're going to make of it uh, a way to, to truly be happy. They call this the royal road to happiness. It's a very difficult uh, path to pursue, but Diogenes thought that he was helping out his fellow uh, members of Athens. He's not actually an Athenian himself, uh, but doing something similar to what Socrates was doing, trying to call people's attention back to what's really important and to tell them that their priorities are off and to do so precisely by the way that he's living. You could say, if Diogenes can do it, maybe I can do it too. And so we have the, the possibility of not living badly, but instead living a happy life following the cynic way of living that Diogenes perhaps took to one of its extremes.